regular posting on social, I'm going to say social networks, I still refuse to use social media as a, as a term. I am very anti-social, oh, anti-social or anti-social media, I'm not sure one <laughs> of the, I'm one of the two, maybe both. Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We are here for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without just working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast. Uh, now our guest today is Jeff Brown and he is the photographer's mentor. Now, when we get guests on this on this show, we do ask them to send over a bio, a brief, like two paragraph bio that I can read out at the start of the episode. Um, Jeff sent over his bio and very, very thank you for this bio, by the way, Jeff, but it's like a page of A4. And <laughs> I, I, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll highlight just the interesting bits of it. That's half a page of A4. <laughs> so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to try and summarize the highlights of Jeff Bo. Um, I will warn you now, Jeff has lived a life. So Jeff started a fishing tackle business when he was at school at 15. He spent six years doing that, joined the Navy, 10 years in the Navy, then launched a wedding photography business, turned that into a six-figure wedding photography business, um, invested £120,000 into buying a country pub, something he calls his greatest ever failure, which led to 60k of debt, divorce and depression. He then became a mentor for photography businesses, wrote two best-selling books for photographers, became a LinkedIn influencer, even if he doesn't agree with the word influencer, I'm gonna call him that, climbed more than 50 mountains and traveled to more than 40 countries. Um, Welcome to the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, uh, Jeff. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Ambitious, um, you've ticked that box straight away, haven't you? <laughs> that, that, that's the best bio I think I've ever seen. Well, you know, every I think for oh god for, for years I've always had a bucket list and a to do list for for life. You know, things that I want to do, and, and and travel's always been top of the list. But I always try to travel to somewhere that other people don't go, um, and somewhere that's really really obscure. So so I like to, and I, I suppose that just gets you uh, you know get you out of your comfort zone and and do things different, set challenges up. I've just I've just actually booked for the three peaks. Um, the National Three Peaks for uh, in June, but the last time I did that was ten years ago when I was a stone and a half lighter, ten years younger, and twenty times fitter than I am now. So um, yeah, well, you've got four months. That, that's absolutely fine. You've got four months. Um, for those <laughs> um, listening on audio only, so Jeff, um, as you would expect from, from a photographer, has a perfectly framed backdrop behind him, uh, which contains a map of the world. So I'm curious, Jeff, is this map of the world curated to you? Have you got like... Yeah, it's one of those ones that actually um, my mother got me for Christmas two years ago, and you can put drone pins in of where you want to be or where you want to go to or where you've gone to. So I, those are all, I think there's about 40 drawing pins in there. Uh, so I've got, I, I went, now that travel's come back, I've got about four or five places I want to try and get to this year because I haven't traveled since. The last The last holiday I had was 2020, um, was in North Korea. Um, and, th- and then I came out of North Korea in January and then obviously the world shut down in March. Fantastic. Uh, Lanzarote was my last holiday destination. Jace, what was yours? Uh, barging in uh, the Birmingham. Okay, so barging in the Midlands, uh, Lanzarote and North Korea, yeah? Yeah, very similar, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. I think it was a bit like, more like North Korea than, um, <laughs> <laughs> than Lanzarote, but yeah. Cool. Uh, obviously, I whizzed through your um, your your life uh, in the opening couple of minutes of this, this podcast, Jeff. Um, you've, you're very entrepreneurial. You've had the fish and tackle business when you were, you know, started when you were 15, run that throughout your kind of early years. You had the wedding photography business, you had the studio, um, school photography business. Um, you've gone into the pub, you've got the mentoring business, you've got the books, you've got the LinkedIn coaching. 
And then you got 10 years in the military, which is almost to me the complete opposite of the freedom and the autonomy of running a business, isn't it? It is, you know what? And it, it's it's weird because um, I felt like went off the rails when I was a kid. So when I was, uh, my, my dad was a lecturer. My dad was a lecturer in applied mathematics, really, really intelligent guy. Uh, my mom was a teacher. And I, up until, you know, only maybe five or 10 years ago, found out that I was dyslexic. But obviously I was dyslexic at school. Going back to the 1980s, I was just thick. I was, you know, I was in the bottom set for everything and I struggled and I, I had a real problem with school. And in those days, you know, it wasn't, they didn't sort of wrap you in cotton wool. They, they told you, you know, and, and it really got, um, I just, I just got a, a complete hatred of school and I, and I also got hatred of uh, being told what to do. So literally from the age of 15, that was it. I, I didn't want to go and work for anybody else which was a bit, bit of a disappointment to my parents, especially my dad, who was, you know, wanted us to go to college and then go to university and then all my cousins and everybody who was going and getting degrees. Um, but I think being dyslexic, um, I've got like quite a creative side as well. So, you know, if you look at my other jobs, you know, photography and, and, and making fish and flies fly tie, and I've always gone along the creative side of things. Um, so, so yeah, so I went into that business Um and that business lasted for about six years. Um, we we sold fish and flies all around the world. We were actually we actually do, had to do a presentation box of fish and flies for Prince Charles because we were we were the youngest people at the time, um, age of sixteen, to get a Prince's Trust grant. And he we were in a Sunderland Enterprise Centre, which was a business centre uh, with about twenty businesses in, and they wanted to present him with a, a gift for coming up and opening the Enterprise Centre. So they'd asked us if we could make a box of hand-tied fishing flies for, for Prince Charles. And uh, we didn't get to present them. It was the uh, the managing director of Whitbread and Marks and Spencers who sponsored the, the centre that, that did the presentation. But he knew who they were off because he came around to our office and he saw our office. You know? um, so that business lasted six years and then that sort of um, went a separate way because I split up with my business partner. We had multiple break-ins and in the end we couldn't get insured so we ended up closing the business down. So I went into working at, you know, Dixon's, the uh, the electrical store. So I worked there for about a year and um, I hated it. I absolutely hated being told what to do. I, hate, I hated having to ask for a day off or put in for a day off. And, you know, it was just that 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 um, that freedom was was completely gone. And then one day on my, di- my actual day off at Dixon's, I'd went to Newcastle to buy a new shirt. And I was, I'd come out of the, the shop with this new shirt, walked past the shop, and next to it was a, a military careers office. And I just stood there and I was looking and I saw pictures of ships and stuff like that. None of my family had been in the military. My granddad was in the Second World War. My dad did his national service in the RAF. And I walked through the door and this guy come up, uh, army guy, and he was like, oh, come here, sir. All right, yes, sir. What are you interested in? I said, I don't know. I know I like the sea and I like... Probably because I used to do a lot of fishing, you know, and I, and I like boats and stuff. And this other guy jumped up from behind the desk, who was obviously a naval officer. He says, "Come this way, lad. You come with me." I'm and picturing was, like, the three there fighting over. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> don't join those fairies. Come over with me. You got to be a real soldier. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. He literally took us over to one side. Um, he says, "What are you interested in?" I says, "I love cooking because I do. I'm really passionate about cooking." And he says, "Oh, we haven't got any. Uh, we haven't got any room for chefs at the moment." Have you seen Top Gun? I'm like, yeah, I think so. He says, look at this. So he puts this video on about um, aircraft engineering. And it looked amazing, these fighter jets and helicopters. He says, you could be doing that. And I was like, oh, where do I sign up? You know, So literally, I signed up for 22 and a half years there and then with my new shirt and walked out. And um, never even thought about it. You know, I got on the train and I went, oh, my God, I've just joined the military. <laughs> <laughs> so so when you think you know how you, the original question was you know it's a bit of a contradiction it actually never went through my mind but the more i yes obviously the military was very controlled as in to working with anybody else like in a job but you know what with all that control and that discipline and stuff i saw a purpose for it mm. but then when i saw you know with like dixon's or you have to you have to do this you have to ask to have this you have to put your hand up to go for your tea break i was like we're only in a shop. We're not at war. We're not, you know what I mean? So I saw a purpose behind the military. And I think the other thing with the military was the excitement and the, you know, playing with boys' toys and hanging out at helicopters and flying around on speedboats. So that that made the the um, 
they're being told what to do a bit of a purpose but being told what to do to work in a store nah that wouldn't do with me so I did 10 years with with them I did two years with the intelligence services as an uh, image analyst because I became a military photographer and then I decided to leave and set up my own business as um, as marketing goes it's a bit like Top Gun it's just easy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you had me nailed. It's like, yes, it was, it was nothing like Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping... When, when's this exciting stuff going to happen? Now? Well, I'm hoping the average height um, was more than five foot two as well, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let's talk about the pub, because we could very nearly be commiserating each other here, because Jason and I want to look at a country pub. Um, yeah. Back in, I want to say 2007, 2008, Jace, was it? Maybe earlier. Yeah, actually, yeah, it was around about that, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've had a pattern in the past and I would go back with a heartbeat, to be fair. Love, loved the trades, loved the, just the whole, whole uh, aspect of it and, and still would do that again uh, if, if my heart would let me. That's right, my brain would let me, I guess. That's the, that's the thing. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> but, uh, yeah. getting in the way. Uh, and I think the only thing that stopped us back then was the bank. Uh, saying no you can't personally borrow money against your mortgage and then uh, buy a business with it and I was like why ever not this is a great investment what could possibly <laughs> go wrong with a nice country pub because we, we've known this pub for a long time we've frequented it we've eaten there we've driven past it it's right on the main road it's it looks gorgeous it's kind of a little bit sort of chocolate boxy isn't it yeah what could go wrong? So, Jeff, do you want to tell us what could go wrong with buying a nice country pub? <laughs> well, to be honest, what could go right? Everything that could possibly go wrong with this pub went wrong. And um, so in 2004, I left the military and started up my, 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 my photography business. And by 2014, I had five different photography businesses, three of them doing six figures and the other two, so like about 50, 60 grand. So I'd, I'd managed to amass quite a bit of money and savings from, from running the, these businesses. And, you know, I'd done, done very well for myself and I had two other business partners, one in the, the boudoir business, uh, the lingerie business, and one in the, the wedding photography side of business. So what we decided was we'd buy a really nice country pub that had like a maybe a huge restaurant on the side that we could we could utilise as a wedding venue as well so people could have their wedding reception meals there. And we found this pub. And it was perfect. It was like a chocolate box sort of pub in, in County Durham, near a place called Beamish. Um, it had like three log fires. It it was it had two ghosts. It was for, it was built in 1678 or something like that, you know. So and tiny little windows, like you know, like uh, something out of a Charles Dickens novel. You're like, oh, this is you know, what could go wrong with this? Absolutely brilliant. So literally we rushed into it. Um the, the we went in and the food was pretty poor. The food was pretty dire. And obviously, you know, I've been really passionate about cooking all my life and I love, and I was like, God, if this is how busy it can be um, with a crap menu, when we turn the menu around, what's it going to be like, you know? So we got in and we, we took the place over and it was only in the, in the first two weeks we started to get niggling signs when people were coming in and going, you're not from Stanley, are you? And I was like, no, we're from Sunderland. Oh, townies coming in the village. <laughs> and, it, and it was basically the... Um, the guys who'd had it, it was a, um, two gay guys who'd had the the pub. They were they were lovely. They'd had it had it like twenty odd years, but then when they left, everybody was like, it was the, people were coming in. And it was Eddie and Stuart's pub. It was never my pub. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we changed the menu, so we changed, we, we, uh, we. I think we give them what we wanted, not what they wanted. They just wanted Eddie and Stuart back in the pub and not me. And then the resentment start, you know, because then I was starting to get a bit resentful because people would come in and go, well, Eddie and you, Stuart used to do it this way. And I felt like, well, I don't give a son about why, you know, this is my pub. I've paid a bloody fortune for it. You know, like, go and get your frozen Yorkshire puddings from the pub down the road. You know, we do all the handmade stuff. And um, it just got worse and worse. We got, um, we got sabotaged to the water supply, which cost over 10000 uh, we had a couple of big events and people had mysteriously formed the fire brigade about the smell of gas. So these events were um, shut down by the fire officer and everything was taped off and we had to refund everybody. And it was just one hit after another. Uh, staff stealing. Um, one of the staff um, who I caught stealing, I flung him out of the pub 
uh, had a bit of a sort of like a hoo-ha with him. And it turns out his dad was one of the hardest men in the, the local town. So he, <laughs> he came down to, to, to sort of like take it out on me. So it was just, it was just one thing after another, you know, broken windows, fights, and, and this lovely little pub, it just built up a huge resentment. So by, um, we, I took it on in the March, March, 2014, by the November, I'd literally emptied my savings account and put as much as I could possibly into this pub to try and keep it afloat. Mm. Um, and by this time I was going through a divorce, stress levels were through the roof. I hated everybody. I hated all my staff. I just felt so on my own. And um, the brewery wouldn't let us out. I had 15 years left on the lease. Um, <clears throat> now, one saving grace was that the guy from who owned the pub over the road told me, he says, do you not know? He says, I says, I'm positive you've got one of the old fixtures and fittings leases. I says, no, no. I says, I, I don't own those. I says, I only own what, you know, the carpets and the furniture. He says, no, no. He says, I'll, he says, give us your lease. I'll go and check with my lawyer. Because I had literally hardly any money. I couldn't go and get a lawyer. So he takes it to his lawyer and he comes back here and Jeff, bit of good news. He says, you don't own everything. He says, you own the fireplace, you own the door everything so so basically i said to the brewery um if you don't let me out this pub then what i'm going to do i says i've just checked the lease I, I own everything i'm going to rip all the door frames out i'm going to rip the fireplace out pull all the carpet so pull the ceiling out and i'm going to have a huge big bonfire in the car park because i can <laughs> so i get a, a message back from heineken head office saying can we have a, a meeting mr brown and that was the, the first, I've never known them respond as quick. And three of their um, top guys arrived at the pub the next day and they told me to stick in till the March and they would let me out in the March. Um, but between the sort of like Christmas and the March, things got worse. Uh, I, I, I did try to drive my car off a bridge, stupidly um, blocked over as well, totally drunk. So luckily I was drunk enough to make a, 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 a huge move a huge hash of it and not actually hit the, not actually go off the bridge, but hit the bridge, woke up the next morning at the time my daughter was about eight year old and she was with my ex-wife, who was my wife at the time. Uh, and I woke up and the first thing was just, what a shame, how could you get to that low? But I just couldn't see, you know, I'd lost all that money. I had nothing left. I felt completely ashamed. Um, I didn't want to go back to my own town, whole hometown of Sunderland because I thought people would be laughing at us and going, oh, look at him. He's the guy who failed, you know? Uh, and it was really, really hard. So I ran away to Northumberland. So I moved. Um, once I did get out the pub in the March, I, uh, I got a, I rented a house up here in Northumberland because um, uh, I couldn't buy a house because I'd already, I'd, I'd been, I'd had a CCG against us at the pub as well. And I came up here and I just wanted to be away. I didn't want to speak to anybody. It was just me and the dog. I didn't know anyone. And I came up here uh, just to sort of like repair myself. And um, luckily, the day, two days before I left the pub was Mother's Day. And as you probably know, the um, it's probably one of the most profitable days of the year. So we switched the tills off. I literally, every penny that came through that door. And then I sold a load of beer to the guy over the road. So I actually walked out that day with about, I think I had 28,000 um, in cash, which was just to tide us over until I could sort my life out. Um, I paid all my local suppliers, the staff got the money, and then I just ran away up to Northumberland for a complete different change of direction. And all that happened over, what, 12, 18 months? So it was, funny enough, we went in a week before Mother's Day and I came out the day after Mother's Day. Wow. So, yeah, 12, 12 months in a week. So thinking back to kind of the the life lesson from that initial purchase was because again we, we've we've made this mistake ourselves where we've we've bought a business and we've dispassionately spreadsheet managed that business and gone okay cool so if we put a better design on this website and we put some ads on here and we do this and we do that we can increase profits much like you said with with the food if we increase the food you know improve the quality of the food it'll be fantastic but that's like saying yeah we'll go into the greasy spoon and we'll put michelin star food in there hike up the prices brilliant on a spreadsheet that looks great until you realize that people love their greasy spoon yeah. They love their four pound all day breakfast and one pound fifty for a cup of tea. You know, Yorkshire tea, I'd imagine. Is is that is that your preferred choice? 
<laughs> probably wouldn't be here, yeah, not this way. <laughs> but it, it's, it, you know, we, we made the mistake. We bought once bought. Sorry, we made the mistake. I once made the mistake. <laughs> I was going to say, come on, John. I <laughs> once made the mistake. of We we purchased a forum for budgerigar owners to talk about their budgies. <laughs> now, my prior experience of budgies was my nan had one. Jason's previous experience was nothing. No, I had a few budgies and cockatoos. Cockatoos. Yeah, cockatoo too. <laughs> I do like me birds. <laughs> but we thought, if anyone can do it, us two can do it. There you go. There's a free pun for you, everybody. Um, so we went in. We bought this this forum for budgerigar owners. Great. So one of the first questions that the new owners get asked is, so you guys own budgies? And I reply with, no. No, my nan used to have one, though. And from that day on, we were the outsiders. We were the people, who, oh, they don't even own budgies. Why have they bought? Oh, they're looking to profit from us. They're looking to rape us for every penny we've got. They're go have you heard? I've heard they're going to start charging for access to the forum. No, we're not. And then we changed the, the design so it was less sort of 1992 oh it's horrible oh we don't like it and then i didn't realize this and i don't know how many listeners of the aob podcast are aware but there are there are two factions within the world of budgerigars um budgerigars are, are show budgerigars by the way they're not just to be kept as pets they are to be shown and within the show there are two factions it was very much um Oh, is it Les Mis or the, the other one where there's two warring factions? Romeo and Juliet, you know, I, I don't know, anyone. It was the Montagues and the Capulets all over again, <laughs> but with budgies. And I thought, yeah, I remember Joey, my nan's bird. That was what it was all about. And yeah, from that day on, we were sabotaged much lower scale than you. But it was that we went in trying to change things mm -hmm. and we very quickly alienated our customers because they didn't want change they were quite happy with the way things were they didn't want us and i think that was the same story yeah. with you in the past. and the thing is as well you know, like you, what you said about you know the charging for the forum and stuff people used to come in and i was like where did you hear this from where did you know there's some of these stories and it was and i think it it, it just became a in that local village and there was like another couple of pubs in this local village, you know, and one was a big wedding venue. And that was the guy who over the road who owned the big wedding venue. I got on great with him. He was really nice. And he he was there for us when I was really suffering. You know, And, it, and if it hadn't been for him, I would have been stuck in that lease and probably trying to get to drive me car for bridge. And then um, the, people used to come in with these. Oh, I hear, I hear that you can only get burgers here now. I went, no, we've got a burger menu with five different burgers. Oh, but I've just told you, you only do burgers and you're going to take, and you're taking the Sunday lunches off. No, we haven't taken the Sunday lunch. And then people, I hear you took Eddie round the back and give him a good hiding, which was the previous owner. And I'm why would I, why would I give him a good hiding? You know, I bought a pub off and why would I be horrible to him, you know? And this, this, these tales were just, they got ridiculous and ridiculous. But people would come in the pub and believe it. Mm. Um, so God knows what people thought of me. I mean, they must have absolutely hated me, you know. <laughs> Definitely. So, can I take you back? Because obviously, we, we you mentioned it earlier. What? So the the night was it that you tried to drive the car off the bridge? Yeah. What had happened when you locked up that night, or what caused you to get in the car, or what caused you to have that first drink that led to you getting in the car? What was what was the was there a trigger, or was it just a I'd had, I'd had a I'd had a fairly bad week up until that, so I'd had uh, I'd had quite a few. I actually had a um, a bit of a disagreement with a group of lads who'd come in purely um, on the Saturday. We, we'd had a wedding on, and a group of the local tough lads had come in, and um, they refused to get out, and they were starting to get quite abusive and stuff. But the wedding was in the other in the in the function room, so um, my manager had come up and says, "Jeff, these lads won't get out." Um, I'm going to phone the police. This says, don't phone the police. And she was like, what for? I said, well, if you phone the police, everyone's going to, there's going to be loads of blue lights come down here. It's going to wreck the wedding. Everybody at the wedding spending loads of money at the moment. I need us every penny. I could. So I actually tried to get the lads out myself. 
and there was five of them and there was only me nobody else came out the rest of the staff just just um uh, left it as it is and let me go and deal with it so i had this this hassle with these five lads which uh, um ended up in a bit of a fight and I got some damage to the car and I got one of the windows put out in the pub. And I think it was just um, an escalation of that. It was just that the fate, I felt completely on my own. And the funny thing was up until the, the final few months at the pub, I didn't actually drink in the pub. I used to keep myself sober. So I would always have a, a sober head if anything did kick off, you know, especially on a weekend, you know, because you, you don't want to be, steaming into something when you've had alcohol yourself and then it was just I felt that was a bit of a release and then I think as you know alcohol can be a depressive so as you know as I was drinking it then the the pressures that I already had just seemed to get worse and worse and worse and then I just decided I would go out for a drive in the car uh, and then I got into an argument on the on the phone on the car and then I pulled over and things just got worse and then I just that was it I was like oh yeah I just ended all you know that, what, was, what was that like at that moment when you, you thought that was the best option or the only option? To be honest, I can't really remember. You know, you, you get to a point is, and I think I'd, I'd, this had happened for, for weeks and weeks. It was a feeling of just being, well, first of all, being completely trapped in the pub. The fact that uh, it, all my savings had gone. I was going through a divorce. Nobody liked me. I didn't have any, I didn't feel like I had anybody to turn to. And I couldn't go anywhere. It's not like I could run back to my house because I lived above the pub. Mm. Um, so it was it was a really horrible position to be in. I'd, on a night, I would, and I couldn't sleep very well on a night because I had stuff racing through my mind. But then on a day, I just dreaded like 11 o'clock opening the door and going down to the pub. And I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't physically go through another day because what was another day going to achieve? Another day was actually going to, take me another day into debt because I, I dreaded the postman coming because every time the postman came, it was another bill. You know, I had like a £10,000 gas bill and a you know, £12,000 water rate bill. And it was just doom and gloom. You know, it was like 11 o'clock the postman used to come in when we opened the doors and, and hand us these doom and gloom letters. And I was like, oh, why am I working? I'm only working to get myself more in debt and to get more depressed. And everybody hates us anyway. So... It's... It's difficult because it, looking back now, it's it's very kind of easy to see the path, where, what you've achieved since. But actually, yeah. in that moment, you can't see anything apart from the big glaring issue where, where there, mm. there is no option, there is no escape. And um, I, I was listening to Jimmy Carr talking about um, depression and suicide recently he said that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem mm -hmm. but at that time you wouldn't have described that as a temporary problem because if it was if you knew it was a temporary problem <laughs> you would not have tried to get in that yeah. car and drive yourself off a bridge would you I, I i seriously couldn't think of it i mean because even if, you know, even if I'd had like 50 grand, how long would have 50 grand had lasted as the, the, you know, I was paying three, three and a half thousand pound a month just in rent, you know, and then I had 18 staff. It was just, and I had to just hang on and hang on. And um, the funny thing was that I really is at, at the time, and, and my mom's 82 now, and she's still a Samaritan. At the time, my mom was the Northeast director for the Samaritans. Um, and I couldn't speak to her about it hmm. because... I'm just one of those people. I don't. I don't sort of like share problems. So I, I put on a brave face, but just keep everything to myself. And my my mom only found out about it because I, I mentioned it in my LinkedIn book. And my mom read a copy of my LinkedIn book, uh, my first LinkedIn book, about four years ago. And she she was absolutely gone. She couldn't believe that I'd gone through that and I'd never said anything. Yeah. How how did you feel when you're writing that in the book, knowing that your mom would probably read that? To be honest, I didn't think she would ever, she ever would because I was like, why the hell would my mom who's 80 buy a book on LinkedIn? Yeah. You know? but, uh, she'd, she'd actually seen it here in the house on the coffee table or in, in one of the, you know, in the kitchen or something. And she picked it, e, is this your book? And I'm like, yes. And then she sits down and starts reading it. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but from, from her point of view, having worked closely with the Samaritans there, she, she will know that men in particular are not 
forthcoming and coming forward. They're not forthcoming yeah. and sharing feelings and, and, and saying when they need help. Um, so that isn't, I'm not saying you know, she's going to blame you or, or you know, anything like that, but she, she will understand why you didn't. She, w- she will wish that you had just picked yeah. up the phone to her on that night before you even got in the car. Yeah. Or, yeah. Not, if not to her, then to one of her colleagues who doesn't even know you. But I'm sure she'll also understand why you felt that you couldn't. Or, again, perhaps at that time, and I, I remember being in a similar situation when I was in my sort of late teens, early 20s, d- didn't even cross my mind to call someone or to yeah. ring the Samaritans or, you know, to tell a loved one. There was... Who, who the hell's going to care? You know, it's they, they can't help me. It was I was trying to logic my way out of an emotional problem. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, you make things a lot worse for yourself as well. So, you know, I wasn't doing myself any favours. Yes, the, the debt wasn't going to go away. And even if somebody had given us the money, you know, then I would have owed them the money anyway. So I suppose I thought, you know, there's nothing anybody can really do. But then what I was doing is it, it, it was that... Um, I was torturing myself by believing that everybody, friends, relatives, everybody thought I was a complete failure. And, you know, when you think about it, nobody, nobody really give a toss. Everybody's too busy living their own lives to care whether thinking, and, and most people, you know, years later, mates turned around and went, well, you know, I wouldn't have had the balls to open a pub. And, you know, you tried it, you tried doing something from, you know, going for your dreams and it, and it failed, big deal. Look at, look at where you are now. You know, and that's like, and this is, so did you think of it as a failure? No, no, no. You know, so, and so do you think about that, about other people? Like now I can look back and think, you know, when my mate's just, his restaurants just closed, his chain of restaurants, do I think he's a failure? Not at all. Yeah. I think of what he achieved to have all them restaurants. I don't think of him as a failure. No, absolutely. And it's, it's the old Thomas Edison. He's, he's tried something, it didn't work. Um, yeah. You know, failing is failing to notice that what you're doing isn't working and keeping on anyway because well what will people think i have to you know i have to keep up appearances what is it the old yeah. thing about you know earning a load of money to buy things to impress people we don't like yeah. Yeah. Totally. so what would what would current you know if you could go back in time and and actually pick up the phone that night and speak to yourself in that car how would you talk yourself down? I suppose now looking back, it's in, you know, it's, it's never as bad as you you think. And, and and I think a lot of it for me, when I when I actually did get up to here, um, was just distancing distancing myself with everybody else because I was I was I was concerned by people around us. So I needed that two or three month space just to 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 just get away from everybody. I think the only person I really saw was my daughter. And at the time she was nine. So she didn't even think, you know, she was excited that we lived in somewhere completely new. And then to start, it's like I'd run everything out my body and and my mind. And I was then filling it back up with with audio books. And I only discovered audio books the week I I moved up here by Google searching how to cope with depression because I I just wasn't sleeping. I was having really bad thoughts. I was was just really, really miserable. And I found out, I remember getting a book by a guy called Craig Beck. Um, And uh, Craig Beck, who's a, he's actually an ex photographer and he does a lot of motivational speaking. And that came up when I was Googling about coping with depression. So that was my first ever audio book and it was called how to have an unstoppable life. And there was a lot of stuff in this book that just resonated uh, with this. And I was, I was up at like three o'clock in the morning, walking the dog in the dark with these headphones on. And and so I went through that book and then I read another book. And then I I even read like um, by Eckhart Tolle, you know, the power of now. So it was just, and I started consuming and and it was like, I was starting to get repairs and I was starting to program my mind in a different way. And, and now I can't remember the last time I lost my temper years ago. I can't remember the last time I got stressed out about anything years ago, you know? So I think going to that ultimate where you're right at the bottom and then nothing by comparison really makes, is is, is bad. So if I got through that, which I did, then, you know, it, it's, um, and, and I'm in a beautiful place. I've completely changed my, my business and my lifestyle now. Um, I see much more of my daughter. I travel a lot more. Um, yes, I don't have, the huge turnover that I had from five businesses, but now there's only me. 
and it's a business that is a coaching business which literally other than you know um, paying for my broadband and internet there's no outgoings you know so I can live there uh, I've probably got more disposable income than I had when I had five businesses it's um buying into the the theme of the podcast isn't it the ambitious lifestyle business yeah, yeah. what you've what you've got now is a business that you you've designed for yourself rather than a business for other people a business for dare I say show for, for you know for well I've got yeah. I own the pub I've, I've got the this business I've got five businesses um, yeah. you know it's you've designed a business that and in your we had a, a little you know the kind of people you used to hang around with were very much oh you know how you know how big your office is and you know how many people you got working for you and what car are you driving now and what private jet are you going to buy when you make your first 10 million and when we kind of scaled back the business after my kind of Alan Sugar moment and said, well, actually, we, we work from home. I mean, you know, here we are, 2022. We work from home is not a stigma. It's, it's you know, it, the whole world has finally caught up. But 15 years ago, in our industry, saying we work from home was, oh, 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 I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, things not working out for you. Like, well, no, we just would rather run a lean business where we don't have to earn a ton of money to open the doors to big flash offices that someone else owns. And yeah, the day we yeah. got a, was it 86,000 pounds repair bill? We got once, Jace. 86,000 pounds to make a shit look better than it did when we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Everything they left and didn't do, we had to make right before we left. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Right. Yeah, we've been there for about 12 months and they wanted us to do about 30 years worth of renovations. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. I just uh, I just love the the fact we've moved to the positivity side of things which is which is which is great and 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 that is, you know, the fact you don't lose your temper and you've you've got yeah. a good grounding and 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 that's obviously giving you some great moving forwards. So you went into the um obviously photography has been your passion all through your life <laughs> and the navy and, and and before that. So looking at helping others get into photography is was a natural thing for you, I guess. Yeah, so I wanted to help because because photographers are creative people and, and they, they go through this vicious circle is that you know, a lot of photographers don't think about the business aspect. They think marketing and boring, marketing and branding is really boring. They don't, they, a lot of them have this preconception that you don't need a brand, all you need is really nice photographs. So they put those really nice photographs out there on a website that has no brand and has no message and they don't have a, even if they do have a brand that might be a, crappy little camera logo very cheesy you know so but thinking that people will look at those pictures and go oh my god they're amazing I want to book this person but then fail to realize that the people who look at their pictures aren't photographers so they don't look at the images the same way as I, I look at them and all their photographer friends you know I've done 750 weddings and that probably one of the biggest compliments you get from a bride is oh god they look really clear because she's not going to say I love the way you've cropped in on this and you, you've exposed perfectly and the leading lines going up here and because she can't see that. She just sees a clear image that's captured emotion. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with photographers is when the business fails to come in and they fail to start making money, they think, oh no, my work's not good enough. I need to be better. So what they do is they buy the next camera up and they spend another three, four thousand pounds on photography gear and go on another photography training course to make themselves even better. And then the same thing happens again because they're not addressing the, the branding side. So, so I started this program, training photographers, and I work with photographers in about 20 countries around the world. I do a lot of speaking events, uh, ambassador for about eight different companies, uh, write for, for magazines, uh, and I love it. And, and, and I try, from the obviously from the paid side, my, my course is quite limited now, and I, I'm hitting, I, I only opened for a week this month, and I've closed again, because um, I hit the number I wanted to get. To, to give the lifestyle that I want and also the freedom that I want. And then I've got like other income coming in from like affiliates and from book sales and stuff, which is good. So it's got that passive income coming in, which allows me now to, to give more back. So I can do more presentations for free. I can write for magazines for free to educate people. So my idea is, you know, you don't have to be able to come on my course because I've got quite a big following in India and in Africa. You know, they're never going to come on a £2,000 photography training course uh, on branding and marketing, but at least I can I can help them. Um, 
But one of the biggest things that I love is, you know, everything is now, you know, work from home, everything's on Zoom, everything's automated. So I never answer my phone. It doesn't, if it rings, I just ignore it. I have an online booking diary, which is set to, you can only book in two days ahead of the current date. So some, so I couldn't wake up tomorrow and go, oh, somebody's booked in overnight. That's ruined the plans. And you can only book two weeks in advance from the current date. So like, my, you know, so a friend could say to us, Jeff, do you fancy, do you fancy a weekend away um, next month? And I'll just go, yeah. Would you not want to check your diary? No, I'll go. I'll be there. And I just love that freedom. It's going back to, you know, that original thing I was talking about at the beginning, that that freedom and, you know, not having to say, oh, can I have a week off in in, in J- July or anything like that? It's that, that's what I love. It's the freedom, the, the freedom and to be able to, you know, I have to have obviously some sort of commitment. I've got that two week commitment on my calendar, but really that's all they need. They don't need to be speaking to us a month in advance. And I just, I just love that. It's, it, it's perfect, you know, and I don't need, loads more money um because you know I, i've got everything i need i've got everything i want yeah. i love the way you kind of described the first the first part there and the, the way you kind of fall into the coaching is because you could swap out the photography pit for any any number of businesses in fairness because and, and it's probably why uh, well it is why john and i do the same thing with with uh, the one percent club and, and and the ambitious lifestyle business is that actually you could as I say swap out that um photography and put any business plumbing carpenting flooring yeah. whatever that might be because they're really good at doing their business but they're not very they don't understand the marketing and the finances and all the other bits which actually go into making the business um successful or, or successful for them if that makes mm-hmm. sense and so being able to open eyes and things within within the groups is is, is fantastic for us and, and yeah and what you're kind of saying there is it absolutely resonates it is most people are really good at laying floors or doing whatever yeah. that might be but actually coming to knowing the numbers making you know making the right business decisions how that, that, that comes about thinking about marketing strategies getting new customers in it doesn't come naturally to 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 those people and and i love that you know the feedback i get and, and quite often when i do a talk you know people go back to this like i'll talk about the depression thing because it it's um it's surprising how many people have struggled with it i felt that same way and only yesterday i got um a, about six voice clips on linkedin from a photographer who i, I saw he was struggling he'd he'd commented on something and I, so, I, so i left him a few messages and he ended up leaving me a few messages back I was giving him some encouragement and he uh his messages went really deep into how he was feeling and he says he's never been able to talk to anybody about this before and how he's feeling and that was ins- and he actually started to cry in the messages which started me off crying when I was listening to them the next day <laughs> I'm, I'm a big soft you know um and I just it's nice that you know that resonated and, and the amount of people who've actually sent us messages and said I haven't even told my wife or I haven't told any of my friends, but I've read this in your book or I've heard you say this. And I just wanted to say, you know, I've had those feelings as well. And it's good to know that. Um, and they're all blokes. I've never had, I've never had a woman say that, you know, and I've got quite a few female photographers, but it's, it's all men and about, you know, the, the 40 to 50 age group. So mm. yeah, it's, uh, it, it's obviously, it's, you know, it's very common, isn't it? You know, so I think it's one of the biggest killers, isn't it? For of guys around our sort of age range. It is, and um, I say we beat the drum, and you know a lot of the media beats the drum at the moment. You know, it's good to talk and getting getting the word out there. It's it's okay not to be okay, um, but it's still very difficult. And let's say that message you mentioned yesterday, um, that person needed to realise that oh my god, there is someone else in the world who's been through what I'm yeah. feeling right now, and when you're in it you do feel completely alone and maybe just knowing that you're not alone mm-hmm. and that there there are people out there who are more than happy to talk to you you know if if anyone listening to this is struggling let us know john at big idea uk i'll chat to you you know i'll talk tell me what's going on um you do not need to suffer alone you know, funny, I read a book last year. I was walking around. There's a reservoir uh, up ours called Kielder Water, and it's 30, it's about 36 miles all the way around. And I decided I would do that early morning and I downloaded, um, oh, I forget the name of the book now. It's Tyson Fury's latest book. Um, and it's called, I think it's called The Fury Method. Yeah. And um, 
I do, I do box and I kick box. I used to box in the Navy. I'm not a big boxing fan. I don't watch boxing on TV or anything like that. And I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll try it. As opposed to a, um, a business book, I listen to a like a biography type of book, you know. So, so I downloaded it and walked around. 36 mile I walked with my dog and Tyson Fury on the headphones, listened to the entire book. And he talks about his, he tried to kill himself. Um, in a, you know, in that, I think it was in, in his Ferrari at 140 mile an hour or something. Like I had, you know, multi-millionaire was successfully achieved where he wanted to go and got his his, his titles and um and it was really really it was probably one of the best books I've read on and how open he was in the book and, and talks about his depression so it can affect everybody you know and, so, and especially you know so, such a big huge powerful guy you know six he's six foot nine or something isn't he He'd be six foot seven or six foot nine big huge powerful guy who seems to have it all and he's got the charisma as well but. Yeah, but, uh, that's all just a front. Yeah, you know? the Jimmy Carr thing I was listening to. He said, you know, it's the difference between sadness and depression. Um, you know, sadness is the circumstances that are leading to it. So yes, if give that man a Ferrari, give that man, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand pound in cash. Um, you take away the sadness, but depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain. It, yeah. It's a physical condition. Um, give that man a Ferrari isn't going to make a blind bit of difference. No. Other than giving him a very fast car, which he probably shouldn't be. Yeah, getting. yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you were one of our star. No, you're not. Not one of you were our star pupil from our last one percent club intake. Um, I think the, the intake before was Alan. We spoke to Al back last summer. You joined in the intake after that, and I, I don't know if you'd heard Alan's um, episode that he did with us, but you certainly seem to embrace his ethos of jumping in both feet getting really involved in the club really involved in the group and really hitting the ground running and getting stuff done um can you walk us through sort of some of the stuff that you that you did when you first joined well one of, one of the things i got was you know i got that um the goal setting book off yourself and uh well, oh, the world domination planner yeah. yeah yeah so that that came through and i was like this is brilliant and then literally i remember speaking to you and 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 saying, I'm going to write one. And I'm going to write one purely for photographers because there's no motivational sort of books aimed at photographers. So I used that idea. And I think within a month of receiving that book, I'd written a one for photographers, um, got it designed and printed and, and put together. And, and it went on to become a bestseller on Amazon within a couple of weeks. And it's still, it was at number two in the top photography books yesterday it's still still going really strong um so definitely got the the one percent club to to thank for that um it's also the other it, it's nice to see to be around other people who are in different businesses because i hold people accountable but nobody holds me accountable so i've got 250 photographers inside my group whose backsides are kick but nobody kicks my backside or gives me um you know Otherwise, I'll just become focused in my own advice to everybody else. And then I'm not actually looking at my own business. So there could be the tendency that I start to slide. And just off today's call, where we're talking about uh, your quick wins, I've got a few notes scribbled there and ideas about, because I send people that journal, but what we talked about today, you know, that journal is part of the program. So why can't I do something to make that a little bit different? So I've, I've even just written down on a piece of paper, Cam, uh, can you get one like, like a squeezy camera stress ball and then put put in chocolate in with this so actually so I've been onto Amazon I've uh, looked at different boxes so that the journal will go in but there'll be like a squeezy camera stress ball there might be an awesome photographer's uh, pen uh, some nice chocolates from Northumberland or a, or a Selkirk bannock oh, watch out for the postage on those bannocks they're heavy <laughs> <laughs> so put something together, you know, maybe, maybe not not have to spend a fortune, you know, maybe 30 quid um of of gifts to send that person because they've spent they've spent two thousand pounds to come on board the course just to give them that something a little bit extra, you know, because they all messages and say, Oh, I've got the book through, Jeff, that's great, thanks very much. But I'm it's after today's call, that's made me think, yes, they're thanking me, but the the pit is two thousand pounds and they're expecting that book, you know. So yeah. why could I, and wouldn't I get a completely different message if I, which I'll tell you next week when when I send that out and and get the responses of people? It's, it's I really enjoyed that call today. Uh, it's an interesting call because it was a topic that I'd taken from Evergreen Assets, 
Uh, not everyone in the group had read that particular section of Evergreen Assets, so lots of people didn't know what to expect. Um, and it was ideally about giving people a quick win. Um, yeah. That is a, a that is what the 1% Club is all about. It's about finding these 1% small improvements to one part of your business. So identifying, okay, when you've got a, uh, a prospect turns into a customer, they've given you their credit card for the very first time, at that exact moment, what happens? What what normally happens? And just injecting a little bit of wow, a little bit of let's say a you know um, camera stress ball because we take the stress yeah. out of uh, out of running your photography business. Um, yeah. Getting your your excellent uh, journal there and actually scribbling a handwritten message in the front of there to your new client who you know a little bit about yeah. because you've done a bit of research and. I think one thing that kept coming up again and again and again on, on today's call was demonstrating that you care about them as a business owner rather than just here is the framework to go and run your business. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it's that because they get, you know, they, I mean, I, I do get um, some good feedback because I, I leave loads of voice clips. I, I always do voice clips. I don't do messages because being dyslexic, I make a lot of spelling mistakes and it just makes me look stupid. So I do voice clips and it's easier to, to get messages over. So I do get a lot back from that personality side of things that, oh yeah, oh, thanks for leaving that message. That's great, Jeff. But, you know, I think giving a gift or having something that's just a little bit personal that they're not expecting, I think that's going to really, and I put the pro- I put the program up in, in price by about 15% uh, last month anyway, you know, so there's, there's money there to put back in on, on the form of some really nice gifts. And, I, and, I, and, and I, another thing, while we're on the call today, I thought, well, hang on a minute, I've got, I'm an ambassador for eight different photography companies and I've got a sponsorship by a big photography um, manufacturer. You know, why don't I approach them and say, can you give us something to, some promotional gear from, you know, because they have T-shirts and all sorts of stuff, you know, uh, and mugs and stuff. Can you help me fill this pack full of goodies because they could be your future customer? Yeah, absolutely. Which it's, it's the old um, what do you call it? The Pampers pack or so. When you when you get yeah a, yeah oh yes you yes yeah, when you had your when you had your first baby you get yeah yeah bounty yeah. bounty that was it yeah bounty yeah, pack. you get a photography you get a photography session as well don't you with the the bounty photography yeah yeah definitely. So what what would be um, your kind of three takeaways then jeff for any photographer well actually let's not just limit it to photography let's say any creative business owner how can they what three tips would you give them to give them a better creative business not to be a better creative but to have a better creative business invest money in branding to get a really solid brand because um if you want to charge a premium price you've got a have a premium brand and um you know people will have an a, a, um an amount of perceived value in your worth just by the look of your website just by your first email you send back you know it doesn't matter whether it's a photograph or whether it's a, a bit of artwork or something if people can't see the perceived value in that if they can't see um if they don't think oh yeah this looks high class or this looks quality because obviously there's that that um, tying together as well of anything that's quality has a higher price. So if pe- if you can get that balance right and you can look premium and charge a premium, then people will buy into it. So I think branding is a huge thing first. And visibility, you know, get yourself out there, be visible. And my own business works on visibility, which obviously the more visible you get, the more credible you become, and then eventually the more authority you get. Um, and everybody starts off, nobody inherits 30 or 80,000 social media followers, you know. Um, so you've got to build them, but you can you have to build them by being present and by being there and turning up every day. So I would say visibility, consistency, and then reaching out. Asking other businesses who already serve your ideal client if there's any collaboration you can do, whether either on a commission-based sort of joint venture or, you know, client collaboration or content creation. And my own business is built on collaboration on content creation, but with people who already have a much huger, bigger following than me. So the Thursday, I'm doing a, another 
Uh, next Thursday, I'm doing another sort of live stream into a, a big photography podcast, but they've got 250,000 members and we're selling a course to his 250,000 members over in America. You know, so I'm using his authority, but I'm giving a load of stuff away. And then at the end of it, there'll be a sign up for a course. Um, so if you can give value and give, 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 and then all the good stuff comes back to you. Mm. It is. And that doesn't mean uh, doing weddings for free, does it? No, no. <laughs> I'll never do another wedding again. Now I'm retired from weddings. That's me done from 750 weddings. I'm done. Fantastic. Now I like that. So branding, um, visibility and collaboration. So yeah, so not uh, John Lamerton photography um, with three social media followers. I don't do social media. <laughs> and my, no, it's my, it's my work. It's my client. No one's getting near my client. Um, I've seen all of those at play with various creatives over the years. Um, it, it's strange that they think about you know their art, but they don't think about how to position the business and their business, um, as opposed to say the, the, the creative themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, anybody who's in, I mean, I know you said that we're, you know, influencer and I've got like probably about 80,000 followers across my various social medias and about 30 odd thousand on LinkedIn now that, you know, I don't really have to do much on LinkedIn. I get about 50 um, people following me every single day. And then when I put a post out, I get good engagement on it. But I started with one follower, the same as anybody. You know, if you've got somebody who's got a million followers, they started with one. But it's that visibility and that consistency that got them to where they are. You know, because if it, you don't inherit 50,000 followers, you have to earn them. And you have to earn that first like, you know. And I remember they getting that first like on LinkedIn and then the first ever comment, you know, but there was, it's like turning on a, you know, having a big huge hose and then turning on the tap. It's going to take a while for it to come out for, so for, you know, a period of maybe six or six weeks or three months, you're going to be putting posts out. that's not going to get a lot of engagement, but that's where a lot of people just turn off and go, oh, it's not working. Like this social media thing hasn't worked. Um, and you've got to keep that consistency up because the person who messaged you on month three or month four and drops you a message and says, I'll be, you know, I'll be following you, I'm interested. They probably saw you about three or four months ago. So four months from now, the people who are messaging you four months from now are the people who saw you today. So you've got to build that relationship up and get yourself out there in, in their news feed so that they start seeing you, start seeing you. Oh yeah, there's that guy I need for, you know, I need some photos. There's that guy I keep saying all the time. He's always, oh yeah, I'll use him, you know? Yeah, so much of success in business is people knowing who you are and yeah. that's marketing rather than advertising. So it, you know, it's why the, the weekly emails that I harp on about in Routine Machine and in Evergreen Assets, it's why I harp on about them so much because every week I get messages from people saying, well, I've started doing it, but I'm not so sure. And then a month later, like, my God, that guy I've been trying to pitch to for three years has suddenly become a client because I've stopped yeah. selling to him. And I've just kind of gently reminded him that I exist every week. Um, regular posting on social, I'm going to say social networks. I still refuse to use social media as a, as a term. I am very anti-social Oh, anti-social or anti-social media? I'm not sure one of the... <laughs> I'm one of the two, maybe both. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm looking for that minimum effective dose. So I do post yeah. on my social networks, but I'm treating it as the long game. Uh, I see people on those networks every day just going for the jugular, trying to sell, yeah. Yeah. Uh, particularly LinkedIn, connecting pitches, rife on there. Um, had a lady literally contact me today. I said, oh, hi, you, you've been reading my book? She's like, no, um, have you got a goal for this year? I'm like, okay, you'd like to sell me something. I've never spoken to you before. I have no idea who you are, but you'd like to sell me something. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, I'll say the 1% Club doors are, are open now, by the way, for people who are listening to this, obviously in March. Um, people, I will get people joining the 1% Club in March who I've not spoken to, but this will be the 28th episode of this podcast they've listened to. Um, they will have opened 60 of my emails. They've been getting my weekly emails. They've read all my books. They know me inside out because as you said earlier, Jeff, I've given out a lot of content yeah. and I've been consistent with it. The reason this 
I believe is episode 86, might be 87, one of the two. The reason it's 86 or 87 is because we haven't missed a month. Mm -hmm. We've got a little routine there that every month we record a podcast. Um, It would have been very, very easy for us in the early days. And I wanted to, didn't I, Jase? You wouldn't let me. I I wanted to quit this podcast after, what, 15 episodes? Three months, wasn't it? We did the weekly to start with. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was about three months, I think. And you went, nah, this is not working for us. This is a waste of time. Too much prep thing needed. Yeah, it's not working. <laughs> so instead of quitting, we made it easier. We went to monthly. We went to, well, let's get guests on. Let's have, let's have people yes. we know and have a conversation with them. And now it just becomes, oh, cool. It's, it's our monthly routine. It's what we do. Um, yeah. And yes, we get clients off the back of it. But we've been doing this for five years now. <laughs> it's that consistency again isn't it it is and i get you know i get so many messages on linkedin so i'll get somebody uh, like uh, two this week people messages and they'll be like hey, jeff i, I, I want to jump on one of those 30 minute advice calls with you i'm interested in your program so i'll go and look at this this person check out their profile and think you've never liked anything i've posted before i've never i don't know you uh you, you've never commented and then the first thing they do when they get on i'll say <clears throat> How are you doing? Oh, it, it's great to finally speak to you. And I'm like, all right. You know, like the only the only message is two days ago. And they'll say, I've been watching you for about six months now. Mm-hmm. But they've never liked anything. They've never commented. But they've been sitting there in the background. Most and that's why on LinkedIn, that, you know, those views are really, really crucial because you can put a post out and have, I don't know, 50 likes and 20 comments, but there's 8,000 views. That's 8,000 people have clicked that see more button and read it and you don't know who's read it and that's the that's the so it's not just the clients it's the opportunity and that's what you know i get so much opportunity where i get a message and it's not somebody wanting to join the program it's someone saying can you write for this magazine or would you speak at this event or would you like to we're interested in sponsoring you for this you know so but i would not have got there if i hadn't been consistently getting myself visible yeah Oh, that's not the answer people want though jeff they want the where's the where's the do this in six weeks yeah <laughs> 100 days to a hundred thousand followers that's what we want isn't it but the thing is you know it's funny enough one of my clients message tagged me in something last week and um she'd she did a post on linkedin that basically said uh 12 months since i started working with jeff brown can't believe it uh, 12 months ago, I had 75 followers. And I was like, oh, Emma, you know, and, and Emma's doing really, really well. So I clicked over at her profile and she's got 4,800 followers. I'm like, that's, that is a, a big growth. And, you know, with with the average person on LinkedIn's probably got about 1,500. She's done really well. And that's just in 12 months. But what Emma's done is she's posted every single day, seven days a week for 12 months. I can't do that. Um, but she's done it. She's every, and she's she's flooded with opportunities and, and and work coming in and she hasn't spent a penny on AdWords. She hasn't spent a penny on Google, um, a, a LinkedIn ads or Facebook ads. It's all just organic putting herself out there. And when you think about it, what she's actually done is only probably taken a 30, 40 minutes a day and it's been free and she hasn't even got a LinkedIn premium account. She's got a free account. Very good. I'm still not working seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> the, the day Facebook, uh, the, sorry, LinkedIn let you schedule posts in advance. I'm, I'm sorted. I'm there. I'm all over that. They want you there live, though, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. So, uh, finally, Jeff, where can people find out more about you and, uh, and your work? Uh, so, LinkedIn. Just type in uh, Jeff Brown on LinkedIn, or my LinkedIn hashtag is Creating Successful Photographers. Or you can go to my website, which is thephotographersmentor.com. Brilliant. thank you very much any parting words you'd like to leave our listeners with just if you're thinking about joining if you're on the if you you know if you're on the fence about joining the one percent club you know um i'm a mentor i mentor other people but every mentor needs a mentor every person needs a mentor everybody needs somebody to be accountable to and it's you know it's the good thing about it it's it's an investment it's not a, it's not like a you know a nine pound you know, it's it's a, a ninety nine pound or whatever you know the, the, the fee is. That it's just enough to make sure that you you you're thinking I'm going to get the value out of this and I'm going to turn up at it and 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 I think it and, and there's so much value in it. There's so much support there, and you know you owe it to yourself to to start 
getting a bit more direction for your business and moving forward. And, you know, there's so many good ideas just come out of it. Like I said, you know, just off to day alone, I've got a, a sheet of paper on, you know, I wasn't expecting to come away with a load of ideas. In fact, I wasn't even sure what the quick wins was about. And then I was like, that is absolutely amazing. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Just the checks in the post. Cheers. No problem. <laughs> send us some cake instead. <laughs> oh, we'll do. We'll send you some lovely, uh, de- send you a Devon cream tea. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Jeff. Uh, thank you for joining us as well, listeners. And we'll see you next month for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast. See you soon. Thank you. So there we are, another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, how do you listen to these podcasts? Uh, please leave a review on that platform. Let us know what we can do better, what you like, what you don't like, and how we can improve to make this show even better for you. We'll see you next time.